I love you. Again, hide me behind the shadow of the cross so that no one gets the praise but Jesus and no one hears and sees me, but they only hear and see you because you are the truth. You're everything that we need tonight, Father. For a world that has gone insane, for a world that is full of deception and lies, Lord, it's so wonderful to know that we can go to the Bible. We can go to our knees in prayer and find the Lord of truth and have the peace that passes all understanding. Father, tonight, again, I thank you for your words, and I bless you for what you're going to do in this teaching. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Come on and teach us and lead us to Jesus. And in his mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen and amen. Last time we got together the book of Acts, we were talking about pressure. I want to go over that again. Pressure is the driving force of heaven. Is that where I was at? I want to make sure I'm on the right spot. Right? Okay, good enough. Pressure is a driving force of heaven that changes a church or a believer from being complacent to becoming useful or fruitful. Pressure. (laughs) If you're not married, you don't know anything about pressure. (laughs) Let me just, you know, you're, you're a free willy. You're a free bird, amen? But seriously, if, you're not, if you don't have relationship around you, whether it's a boss or it's a mother or it's a wife or it's a husband or it's whoever, you don't understand pressure. But when you have somebody around you like that, how many of y'all know you got pressure? Amen. And pressure is the driving force. Brother Michael and Tom, no, uh, t- uh, uh, t- what is your name again? Tim, Tom, and Tony. That's the Trinity over there. You didn't know that? Tim, Tom, and Tony. They know about, about hay time when pressure comes from mama to get that hay off the ground, amen, get it bundled up. But it's a driving force of heaven to, that changes a church or a believer from being complacent to becoming useful or fruitful. We need to be pressurized sometimes. Again, we don't like to hear that because, you know, for the most part, we are comfort creatures and couch potatoes and we have a remote that grows out of the end of our hand and a lazy boy stuck to the bottom of our seat and that's our life. It's Wally. I tell you, I love the movie Wally. One day we're going to watch it here as a, as a family for a church night because it's hilariously true uh, where the world becomes so dependent on machinery, everybody's just plastered to a chair. Uh, that's pretty much where we are here in the world. So all the children said, Wally, Wally. Without change, the church becomes stagnant. That's why most denominations never really change. They just paint the building, they get a new bishop, they get a new presbyter, they get a new logo, they get a new flyer, they get a new hymnal, they get a new this, they get a new that, and they never move into a new revelation. In fact, they never get past the old revelation that Grandpa, pa, 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 and whoever else came up with it, they stick to it. They build a church around it in a denomination, and if you touch the holy calf, you will die instantly um, by the crocheting lady in the back. Some of y'all ain't here today. But without change, the church, so y'all, how many of y'all remember the crocheting lady in the back? I, I preached one time at a, at a old Pentecostal church, and the lady crocheted the whole time I preached. It was a crochet. Crochet and crochet. There's the French crochet, and then there's the pig Latin <laughs> hillbilly crochet. And then if you're in Mississippi, it's ricochet. I'm trying to warm you guys up. Is it, is it too cold in here? I'm trying to help you guys, man. You all look like frozen, man. Work with me. This is the comedy hour. Work with me. Come on now. You know who I'm talking about. 
Remember that one time I said, what was it, silhouette? It's a silhouette. What is it called? The shoe. No, it's not a silhouette. <laughs> it's a silhouette, man. Go get some silhouettes. It was that, sh what was that shoe I called it that one time? And you all dogged me out and said, it ain't a silhouette. It's a skeletto. A man in the back says skeletto. Way to go, John. Stiletto. You were close. He did say stiletto. You weren't listening. All right, let me move on for y'all take over. Persecution, which I'm feeling right now, and pressure are the two requirements for true growth. Watch this. Persecution and pressure are the two requirements for true growth, whether it is a person, church, or ministry. It's true. It's true. Persecution needs to be a part of your life. You're not asking for it. Again, this isn't the death wish. This isn't some type of freaky, you know, I want bad stuff. No, pressure and persecution will come in your life if you're going to live right. The Bible says so. If anybody's going to live godly, they're going to suffer persecution. If you love Jesus and carry your cross daily, somebody's going to try to nail you to it. If you love God with all your heart, a religious person is going to try to trip you up while you carry your cross. So we're all going to face some type of persecution and some type of pressure, but if we deal with it properly, it'll be a change agent, which I'll talk about in a minute. We must realize that, that to be successful in life, we need a friend and an enemy. Again, success is not bling. It's not a Bentley. It's not a Mercedes or a home. Uh, success is having peace with God. The greatest success you and I could ever have is to lay our heads down on our pillows at night knowing there's nothing between me and God and should I pass from now into eternity, from here into eternity, I'm in heaven with God. I did everything I could to make it right with my neighbors and my friends and people I may have offended, but most of all, my heart has been secured in Christ through his precious blood, all right? So we must realize that to be successful in life, we need a friend and an enemy, an enemy and an advocate and an adversary, you need an advocate. You need somebody that is there on your side, somebody that you can call on and say, hey, I'm dealing with a battle. Be careful who you share your heart with because not everybody's an advocate. Not everybody who says they love you, you can share your heart with because one day you'll find your laundry out in front of everybody. How many of you ever been there before? You had confidence in somebody, might have been a pastor, might have been a leader, might have been just a friend, and you shared your heart, and you poured it out, and you said, man, I'm dealing with this in my marriage, or I'm dealing with this on my job, or I'm dealing with this in my personal walk with God, and next thing you know, they turn your, their back on you, and they've told everybody. So be careful. A true advocate will be one who holds your secrets dear, and they'll be prayerful over you. Remember this, there's a difference between cover up and covering. If somebody is not a true advocate, they will go to try to cover up things. But a true advocate is one who is a covering. In other words, if somebody commits a crime, you don't cover it up. You commit it, you speak it, you tell the law enforcement, you say, hey, whoever, there has been a crime here, but I'm willing to cover you and help you during your process. A true advocate will do that. They don't go and tell anybody. They just say, look, I'm going to be a covering for you, but I can't cover this thing up. We need to deal with it. All right? And then uh, an adversary, you know, uh, an adversary is one that, that will... Uh, bring you to a place of pressure and a place of persecution. So you need both of that. Watch this. Both are needed on our journey. Again, not very popular thing to say or to hear because we want life rosy. In America, we want things with no problems. You know, we, we, we just want to coast, man. Leave me alone. I just want to do my thing. I just want to go to church. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be told to do this. And, and, and that's the way I like church. And preacher, if you mess with me, I'm not going to hang out with you because I need my life chilled. Well, you know what? You, you're, in the wrong, you're in the wrong planet. You're in the wrong planet because whether you live for Christ or not, you're still going to be messed with. You're still going to have pressures. You're still going to have pain. But I'd rather have an advocate. I'd rather have an intercessor and someone I know that will help me when my enemies do come. And they will come. So Acts chapter 4, 
Remember, from peace to war. I mean, everything was awesome, and all of a sudden, these guys started standing over him. Next thing you know, they're right there. Here comes the mall cop. Here comes the temple cop. Here comes the thugs. Here comes the clan. Here comes the clique. And they're going to deal with these dudes. And you're going to see something here, this transformation of the church, the transformation of the leadership. And it was divinely orchestrated, okay? Remember, Jesus warned the disciples everything that they were going to go through. They didn't see it because they're hanging out with the king. They didn't see it because they are with the boss, if you will. They're with their leader. They're watching Superman, if you will. They're watching the Lord Jesus do miracles and go through all the things that he did. And they were protected, if you will, underneath his anointing and his shield and his covering. But then there would come a time when he said, hey, they're going to deal with you just like they dealt with me. And I'm going to show you that in a little while. So here they are, they're, they're being dealt with. The Sadducees, remember, they're called the righteous. They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. Don't you believe in the resurrection? I do. I believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I also believe in the resurrection of the righteous. Amen. And to eternal glory. They were greatly annoyed. As you go into verse 2, they were greatly annoyed. Why were they annoyed? They was about to be shut down. They was going to lose their money because everything about this miracle pointed to Jesus and pointed to resurrection. They were going out of business and they didn't like it. Remember in verse 3, they laid hands on them. Remember that? Laid hands upon them in the Greek word there. I gave you that definition. It means like to, to be thrown on. This wasn't laying hands like, I bless you, I want to pray for you, brother. This is, I'm fixing to thug you and throw you down and arrest you. And one of the terminologies was like rushing water or a wave towards a ship. So it wasn't an easy thing. Then in verse 5 and through 6, it talks about the big meeting that they had. They were, the pressure was mounting. What do we do? They locked them away overnight. And then verse 7, watch this. Your enemies will always challenge your authority. If you're being challenged right now, anybody listening, watching, whatever media platform, if you're being challenged, your enemies are trying to, to lessen your authority. The enemy's trying to knock you down from the position of the anointing that you've been given. So he embattles you and makes you feel less worthy than you really are. And he tries to take your authority down a notch so he can weaken you and harm you. That's a sign that you're about to be promoted. It's a sign that you're about to get your second wind and he's about to be exposed and you're going to walk in, in a greater degree of anointing. Remember with God, you never go back permanently. You always step back momentarily so he can step up in front of you. And then when he does, get ready. That draft of him stepping in front of you because what? The Lord fights my battles he goes before his people as we, as Judah, we praise him. Oh, there's a lot in that tonight, but that's not where I'm headed. That's just a word for somebody. Amen. So your authority is about to increase. All right, the book of Acts for tonight, Kingdom Perspectives. I'm going to give you some opening statements that are really going to carry on for, for just a little bit because I'm dealing with now change. We talked about pressure. We talked about persecution. But we're going to go through this teaching here. We're going to start to see some change that's going to take place and is already taking place right now as we're, we're going into chapter four. So change is the agent. Change is the agent that opens the doors to our destiny. Change is the agent that opens the doors to our destiny. Change. Change is the agent that opens the door to our destinies. Some churches, and you put a slash believers, some churches and believers are one change away from greatness. Change is the agent that opens the doors to our destiny. Some churches and believers are one change away from greatness. 
That speaks to a lot of us. There can be a certain change in your life that can give you better health. There could be a certain change in your prayer life that can take you to the next level of anointing. There's certain changes in life that can be an agent that opens the doors of destiny if you let the Holy Spirit help you make that change. Okay? So this is going to tie into all the teaching that the church is going to go through here in the book of Acts. Change is more than a decision. Change is more than a decision. How many of y'all know when it comes January 1st, I mean, the heavens are full of changes, the verbal changes. I'm going to change. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do And if you could just see it in the clouds, you know, it's just full of changes. They're words. And then on February 1st, <laughs> those changes never happen. You're back to the bomb bombs. And Dairy Queen. Huh? Treadmill has a new layer of dust on it. And your winter coat looks really good. Miss Betty and I were talking about, about that before service. We have a really nice treadmill at home. And I have never seen a better coat rack on the planet than that one. Very expensive one, by the way. But change is more than a decision. Listen, it is the determination it is the determination of the heart. It is the determination of the heart that shifts a church or a believer from nominal to exceptional. Change is more than a decision. It is the determination of the heart that shifts a church or a believer from nominal to exceptional. See, it can't be just a decision because decisions are usually part of the suke or the mind process to where we see something, we say something that we want to do and it becomes more of a head thing and that's how our commitments get broken. That's why you never go into relationships through the head. You go through the heart. You should always pray your relationships around you. How many all know that when you don't do that, you're going to have to pray that relationship away from you eventually? I've done it many times in ministry. You, 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 it just happens. Okay? But hear this. I don't want you to miss this. Change is more than a decision. It's a determination of the heart. When do we really see change in our lives? when we finally become determined in our heart to say, you know what? I'm just using this as an example. I'm tired of being overweight. I'm tired of carrying this extra pound. I'm finally going to get back to my goal of saying I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I'm just using that because that's what we all try to do. You know, we go back and look at our high school pictures and after we get done laughing, you know, we may never get back to that physique or whatever but at least we become determined to try to do better. So I'm using weight as an example, but it could be deeper than that. It could be our relationship with God. When are we going to become the prayer warrior that we always told God we'd be? When are we going to become that person, that Berean who said we're going to read the Bible? And all these commitments we make, we'll never do it by just saying it in the mind. We have to have a heart determination. So I went a long way around the block to get this point out because it's very important, because if the church of Jesus Christ is ever going to do what God's called us to do in the last days, the decisions we must make, the changes we must make cannot come from the head. It has to come from the heart. That's why we're in trouble. We have all kinds of Decisions made in the flesh and in the head, trending and, you know, what's fashionable and what program should we have in the church? None of that has changed our world. None of it. Because it hasn't been a heart shift. Okay? It'll make sense here in a minute. Watch this. Change is a tectonic shift. It is a tectonic shift of ideals, thoughts, in focus. It's like an earthquake. Real shifting, real 
change. It's like an earthquake in our ideals, our thoughts, and our focus. Uh, again, you can, you can use losing weight, you, you can use exercise or what have you, or quit, quit a, an addiction, smoking, what have you, and say, I have this, this shift, this earthquake type of shift in my mind, in, in my heart, really, in my heart to where I've had enough of this, I'm tired of feeling this way, I'm tired of looking this way, I'm tired of being this way, I'm tired of spending money this way, or whatever it is, and all of a sudden your ideals, your thoughts, and your focus totally change from what you used to be by the help of the Holy Spirit into what God sees you as being. That makes sense? It makes a lot of sense because it is what is needed for us to make the change. Now here we go, the first church changed history. The first church changed history. What do you mean changed history? Well, the ecumenical order of that day, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, all of these temple, you know, guardians, if you will, of the law, they had it packed, they had it set, they had it standardized, they had it under control, but the first, ca first church came in and changed all that. Watch this. The first church changed history and affected destiny by accepting and embracing the pressure of change. The first church changed history. I mean, as far as these, these Pharisees and Sadducees were concerned, this is the way it was going to be until later, 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 the Messiah would come. Well, he already came. They had, they had hold of the people, but they changed it, and they affected destiny by accepting and embracing the pressure of change. All right, so now let's preach this. Let's teach this. Let's look in the life of, of the book of Acts here, the, the first church, and as we move along, we're going to look at change. All right, Acts chapter 4. Last time I left you, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? All right, so now they're being questioned. They were being questioned. Peter and John had been changed by the Holy Spirit. Peter and John were not the same guys. This is why I believe that once you and I have a true encounter with God, we're changed forever. That's why when I hear people say, well, you know, I, I can't get to church, and I, I this, and I this, and, and, and it just seems like to be this complete struggle. To me, my view and my analysis, I doubt you really got saved. I doubt you really got touched by God. I doubt you really had a move of God touch your life and affect your heart to make you change. I really doubt it. I seriously judge it. Why? Because everybody that came in encounter with Jesus was changed. Every one of them. Every one. If they were dead, they became alive. If they were blind, they saw. If they were deaf, they heard. If they were lame, they walked. But this group of church people today, you can't move them. I mean, you look and say, where's the transformation? Where's the evidence and proof and the fruit of the Spirit? Where is there proof that you have literally been changed? I don't see it. Well, you're just judging me. Wait, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at the fruit. I'm just looking at everything and wondering, what in the world? Because my Bible shows me that anybody got near Jesus, they were transformed, buddy. Well, that was Jesus. Hello. That's what we're talking about. Did you meet Jesus when you got saved? Did you really meet him? Did you really get born again? Glory to God. I'm telling you. But they were changed. So let's talk about Peter and John. They were changed, man. They were full of the Holy Ghost. They were being transformed. And now watch this. Peter and John, the change agent, the pressure, the persecution, and everything, it was working on them because they weren't like this prior to the baptism. But now something has happened. And they asked them, they said, hey, what's up with this? How'd you do this? And, and what name? Verse 8. Watch. Then Peter, filled 
with instructions from the denomination You didn't get that in your Bible? Peter got a text message from the bishop. Peter filled with the red back hymnal. No, man. Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Woo. Didn't say half full. Didn't say one quarter, three quarters. Said he was filled he was full up of the Holy Ghost. Here he is being questioned. He's being questioned by people who have the ability to do harm to him. The same people that were there who just murdered Jesus. You got to keep this in your mind. The murder scene wasn't too far away. The murder event was not that many days prior. Do you recognize and realize the persecution and pressure that Peter and John were under because they went into enemy-held territory with their advocate? They went into the place of the adversary, but they had a friend named Jesus. And they stood in that temple area and saw this lame man raised up. And now they're being thrown into a jail cell and now being brought out and being asked by whose name and how did you do this thing? And they knew exactly what these men were doing. And they knew exactly it was in the name of Jesus. But they just murdered him not long ago. Read your Bible. We need to look at the whole scene and see how strong Peter was in verse 8 when it says, And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You got to be full before you ever speak. You got to be full of the Holy Ghost before you ever speak. That's why some people won't witness. That's why some people don't speak. That's why some people don't go out in public. That's why some people can't make it to church. That's why some people can't stand up for the Lord. That's why some people, when it's time to worship, they sit on their hands. Because they're not full to speak. When you're full, you're open. They were full of the Holy Ghost. They weren't afraid, man. They were going to speak the word. Again, they were, they were standing before mass murderers. I don't know about you. I would be a little intimidated. I, I think that would bother me a little bit if I realized that I'm standing in front of, of a stalker and a murderer. I think that would kind of make me reach. <laughs> reach for my, my Ruger. Make me look for an escape route or something. But no, not Peter and John. Because they were full of the Holy Ghost. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He is that change agent. He allows that pressure to come in. And they were full of the Holy Ghost and they began to speak. You need to write that down because when you're full, you will speak. When you're full, you will stand. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you will do things that your body doesn't want to do. I said all the things that I, I would, uh, emotions I would go through in my flesh, but I know if the Holy Ghost was upon me and in me and has wanted me to stand up and say something, he would empower us to do that. In the natural, we'd just be kind of like, didn't you guys just kill somebody recently? Think with me now. Use your imagination when you're reading. This is, this is a huge deal for these guys. And they filled with the Holy Ghost and said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel... If we, if we this day be examined of the good deed. Now, I want you to write this word down for examined. A-N-A-K-R-I-N-O. Anna Carino. A-N-A-K-R-I-N-O. Anna Carino. That's 350, 350. If you're going to study it out in the, in the uh, strong concordance, it's a Greek word. It means examine, but it means to judge 
but in a forensic sense. Forensic. In other words, they just weren't sitting there, everybody's passing out tea for the morning and for the day and having a nice conversation with these guys sitting in a lawyer's office. They were examining them like a forensic examination would be. Another part of that definition means investigation. And then the last part of that definition means to interrogate. You have to study the Greek to get the picture of what was going on. Just reading it doesn't always help you because you just say, and they went into jail, then they got out, then they went into the guys and they talked to them and then they... No, you got to see what's going on. That's just the, the way the Bible is written. You have to explore the Hebrew and the Greek. So they were basically being interrogated. They were under great pressure. They were under great persecution. They were under investigation. They were being questioned. You got to go back to verse 7. As I read everything from uh, these verses down, you got to go back into the mind of what these guys were trying to do to them. They wanted to know who and how, what name, and how did you do this thing? Okay? So he begins to speak. Verse 9, if this day we be examined of the good deed. Notice he said good deed. There's a reason why Peter said good deed. The reason he said good deed is because the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, they were trying to make it a criminal deed. Write that down, criminal deed. This, is one, this wasn't an, a matter of ethics. This wasn't a matter of morality and re religiosity or anything religion-wise. This was about criminality. They wanted to catch them like they tried to catch Christ. They wanted to do to them what they did to him. Okay? These guys were tyrants. Their whole world was being affected by these two men and by this doctrine of resurrection and power in the name of Jesus. They were very threatened. Okay? So he said, good deed. Telling them that this wasn't criminal, this was a good thing. Done to the impotent man, by which means he is made whole. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, let's just be plain, who you murdered. Now what is Peter doing? Peter is turned the tables, and started to interrogate them. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit will go from defending to prosecuting, from trying to defend a position to bringing out truth that brings offense to those who hear it. The Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit does that so that he can bring about truth and he will give you that strength. That's why we're not to worry about what are we going to answer when someone comes against us and persecutes us. We're not to worry about and have any thought about what we're going to say. Because why? We're full of the Holy Ghost. And he'll speak through us. And we'll speak the words of Christ. If you ever get a chance, read, and this is very hard reading, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I think I, I have a couple copies somewhere. Uh, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I encourage you to purchase, purchase those. I know they're still available. In the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you get to read of the last testament, last words of people who were, who were killed in the name of Christ, for the name of Christ, and how they were burned at the stake, and how that their words were so powerful and so riveting. You would think you would hear, oh me, oh my God, please, Why? You didn't hear that. You heard them preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as they gave their life. In our natural minds, we would think, I would struggle, I would scream, I would threaten, I would cuss, I would curse, I would do whatever. But not true when you're full of the Holy Ghost. And so I encourage you to read that. It's hard reading. You probably won't find it in most Christian megachurches. Um, but it's, it's good for you to look back and see what some of these great saints said at their dying breath. Amen? I brought that out because in relation, 
Peter and John didn't know how this was going to go. Remember, their master was just murdered. They didn't know if they're next. Jesus had taught them and said, look, you're going to have to learn how to lay down your life. You don't think those words were rolling around as they sat in that temple jail? I guarantee you they were rehearsing and saying, oh, man, he went through this. Man, this is our time, I guess. And they came out in fire, man. That pressure changed them, all right? I'm telling you, the church is going to change. This weak, anemic, sissified, snowflake, baby cake, wet diaper church that's out there, it's going to change. We're going to grow up. And the only way we're going to grow up is persecution and pressure. I'm sorry. Mr. Slick-haired, shiny shoe evangelist is not going to come in and dab you in the head with a boldness wand. You're not going to get it that way. It's going, to be, it's going to be inside of you already, and it's going to come out in the time of pressure. Watch. All right? So what's he do? Where are we at? Verse 10. So he's saying, man, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom you murdered, whom God raised from the dead. Don't you know they about how all grabbed a bunch of Xanax or whatever they take, you know, and just started popping pills. You mentioned resurrection again. <laughs> never mind, I ain't going to go that far. I almost said cool. Never mind, I ain't saying it. Even by him, all right, black beauties, you know what I'm talking about. Both this man stood here before you whole. He said, we did it in the name of Jesus. You want to know verse 7, who, how, what, where? Here, by the name of Jesus, the one you murdered, who's been crucified. He's been raised up by God. He is the one that did this, and the man is standing right there. It ain't a crime, it's a good deed. Give me none of your smack. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. In other words, you're the ones that was building this religious system, this whole temple system, this whole thing of ritual and all, all control over the law and over God and how people can reach God. And you rejected the very cornerstone, which was Jesus Christ. I mean, he just, I, I, he just, bam. This is the same Peter that cut off some dude's ear. This is the same one that denied Christ and started cussing. Had a woman put him down. That's bad. Big old fisherman, a woman put him down. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the what? It's become the head. The head, the head cornerstone. Now, now why does that matter? I don't have time to go into it because I'm already almost out of time here. Psalms 118.22. Not only is Peter preaching, he's prophesying. Because David spoke about it. Psalms 118.22. Let me give you another scripture I didn't get a chance to go to. Just use this as your homework. Matthew 10.18-20. Matthew 10.18-20. What is Jesus saying in Matthew 10.18-20? He said, you're going to go through the same, same things I went through. He's saying the pressure that was on me, boys, is the pressure that's going to come on you. Hey, if they tried to kill me, they're going to try to kill you. Why all of a sudden we get freaked out in American church and, well, this is hard to live and this is hard to do and I can't be a Christian and I can't be faithful to God and I can't be faithful to church. Jesus said this stuff's going to happen to you. We used to say at our house all the time, buck underneath it, little buckaroo. Deal with it. Put your little cowboy boots on and stomp your way on out and fix it. Do what you got to do, big shot. But we're so sissified and watered down and pampered and pampers. No, it amazes me. And I'm not mad at anybody. So I don't think I'm you know, using this to take a shot. I, it's just, I see it all the time. I've seen it for 25 years of ministry. I don't know. It amazes me, man. But when they're in trouble... Jesus! Can't even say his name right then. So Matthew chapter 18, uh, eight, uh, chapter 10, 18 through 20. 
I gave you that. Okay, I gave you Psalms 118.22, then Matthew 21.42, where, where Jesus says, hey, you know, they, they've rejected me. He's, he quotes David. That's powerful. Remember, they're standing before investigators. They're standing before their tormentors. They're standing before their judge and jury. They're standing before people who had the power to do what they wanted to do with them. They had the power to shut them up, but Peter was full of the Holy Ghost and he had something to say. Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, no other name, under heaven given among men wherewith we might be saved. No, we must be saved. That's the gospel message right there in a nutshell. Full of the Holy Ghost. He told them, there ain't no other way to get saved. There ain't no, no other way to the Father. There ain't no other way to be redeemed. It's in that name, the name of Jesus. In verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now let me give you this a little bit. Give me five minutes and I'm out of your way. I can't rush this through right here. Okay? They saw the boldness. That word boldness in the Greek means free and fearless confidence. Wow. Boldness is not just you standing up and, and saying your piece about an argument over church carpet or whatever. The bingo score. Uh, that's not boldness. Boldness is free and fearless confidence. In other words, they didn't care if they died. If that's the last day that they tied their sandals on and that night someone was going to untie them for them, so be it. Boy, we don't have that in the church. We don't have that tenacity to get into the house of God. We don't have that tenacity to serve God. We don't have that free and fearless confidence in God. No, because we're more worried about hanging on to the world than letting it go and holding on to the hem of his garment. It's the truth. It's the truth. You got to remember this. If it's happening in the world, it's worse in the church. If it's happening that way in the world, it's worse in the church. Because the church, for so many parts and reasons, is very undisciplined. Not everybody. I'm not talking to everybody, but you know who, who they are because they know who they are. Now watch this unlearned. Are you there? Verse 13. Let me give you the word A-G-R-A-M-M-A-T-O-S. A-G-R-A-M-M-A-T-O-S. The number is 62. Ag- Agromatus. Agromatus. Okay. T O S. T O S. Yes, ma'am. 62 to look it up, okay? It means to be illiterate. Sounds like ignoramus, don't it? But it means to be illiterate, unlearned, and grammatically in, in the Greek, it means like no letter. There's no letter. So they're uneducated. Now, watch this. This is important. I'm bringing this out to you. And then the word ignorant is I-D-I-O-T-O-T-O, excuse me, I-D-I-O-T-E-S, I-D-I-O-T-E-S, and that is 2339. It translates and it means idiot. Now, in our modern vernacular and the way we live in our culture, we automatically think they're a bunch of hey, hey, you know, just ignorant and dumb and whatever you want to call them and, and you know, can't, can't tie their shoes and haven't brushed their teeth in a month. Or anything. That's not what they're talking about. This is how high and lofty these men were, these Sadducees, this Sanhedrin, this whole temple guard. 
They were saying to them, you are unlearned. You have not sat under a rabbi. You have not sat under our teaching. You have not sat under the law. You have not been ordained by us. You don't have no right to teach and to preach. You don't have the right pedigree. How many of y'all ever been told that in church in so many ways? When I was growing up in ministry, uh, you know, these big dogs and big guys who controlled the whole thing, you know, they wouldn't give you the time of the day because you weren't ordained with them. You weren't part of the denomination. You weren't this and you weren't that. You were considered ignorant and you were considered an idiot, okay? This is what they were thinking and, and, and saying to themselves to these guys that you don't belong. But isn't it awesome that the Holy Spirit will change you and give you access and give you opportunity to preach in front of all these so-called big shots of Israel just by being full of the Holy Ghost? And that's what happened. But watch this. That's what he said to them. You're ignorant men, but they marveled. Even though they're like, you're not even a part of our club. You're not even, you don't even have a card that shows that you're ordained. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had to admit they were with Jesus. They had to admit that they had a higher calling. They had to admit that they were touched by Jesus. Let me tell you something. When you're really full of the Holy Spirit and that pressure comes on you and that person come, pressure, er, and persecution comes on you, that change begins to take place. And people will recognize that you've been with Jesus. It also means that they were rude and unskilled. In verse 14, beholding the men or the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Nada. Zip. They couldn't say a word. Let me leave you with this thought. The miracles will always shut the mouth of your critics. The miracles will always shut the mouth of your critics. Well, I don't believe Jesus heals today. Here I am. Well, I don't believe God can redeem everybody. You got a few minutes and a cup of coffee? Let me tell you what trash I used to be. Well, I don't believe that God will bless you and money comes and all these different things. Can I show you where I used to be and now where I am today? You got a few minutes? You see, the miracles will always shut up the mouths of the critics. So we need that today. We need to speak the truth. These men went through the same thing that Jesus went through. And so will you and I. So as we go along, we're going to learn about the change that transformed these men that is also going to transform us in the last days. Heavenly Father, I deliver the word today. I pray it changed somebody's lives and challenged them. We thank you for change. Lord, we really don't like it. We're kind of comfortable in our life. We like what time we get up and we like the way we do things. But sometimes change is a great motivator to bring us into our destiny. It is an agent, Father, that you have put in our lives. May we recognize change, may, may we embrace it, and may we forever, Father, be willing to become who you called us to be. Bless your people tonight, Father, and everybody watching and listening. We love you. We look forward to Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.